Welcome to another edition of Wildcat Country. Eric Cohen and Shane Dale, and what a big show we have for you, even though it's a bye week. So let me just preview it We're right off the bat. Coming off a bye week. It's no, it coming, is no longer a bye week. Okay, fine. Coming off a bye week. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, of course. All right, Miles Simon making his debut appearance on Wildcat Country, the most outstanding player in the 1997 NCAA tournament, and we all know who won that that year. Uh, secondly, Max Brown, who is a Pac-12 network analyst, uh, football analyst, who's excellent, going to join us to break down the Wildcats-Oregon State matchup. Finally, my pal Jake Voorhees, who is the producer of Early Edge on Sportsline. You can also, uh, he also produces the Sportsline College Football Show on Wednesdays that I am a part of on YouTube. So Jake will be on to make his picks and see if he can outdo some of our colleagues, the coach, Jonathan Coachman and Alan Bell, who uh, we had earlier in the season. But Shane, uh, it's, you know, listen, we have some big games coming up. Uh, this is a big show, but let us start, as always, with our newest segment, Shane's Standouts. Let's hear what you got. Which, again, was your idea, and I appreciate that. Uh, of course, no football to talk about this past week, but we'll mention a couple of, uh, of the new basketball guys, new guys on the basketball team. Uh, Caleb Love and Kishad Johnson, who combined for 42 points on 17 of 20 shooting. Ooh. In Arizona's exhibition win over the Lewis Clark State, mm-hmm. uh, you know, again, let's feel free to overreact to that as much as you want. Mm-hmm. Arizona, Arizona went thirty-three of forty-three from two-point range in that game. Now, and again, it's exhibition. Uh, no Omar Ball or Pella Larson in that game, but it's good to see the newcomers living up to the hype in the limited way they've been able to so far. So we'll we'll give them that, and it gets fans excited for the season. And there's and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and then I'll mention, uh, I mentioned her before, I'll mention her maybe this, for the last time on this uh, on this podcast, Hope Heisey, goaltender for the soccer team, uh, tied the program saves record in a 1-1 draw against number 11 USC on senior day, the all-time saves record um, for any uh, goalie uh, for the soccer program. She's done a fantastic job. The, the, the soccer team has had kind of a, a mediocre season, but she's been a star. She's represented the university so well. So I wanted to mention her uh, at least one last time here on this podcast. Awesome. And congratulations to Hope. She has been a beacon of light in a soccer program that has been middling, let's just say, uh, over the past several years. Opportunities. Uh, we like to say opportunities in the corporate yes. world. Yeah. Yes, of course, of course. All right. Now it's time for our normal uh, you know, opening segment, which is by yourself presented. Well, or something like normal. that, right? All right. Normal, you know, normal. The, the abnormal stuff is over. Let's get back to the normal stuff. <laughs> the normal by yourself. So, hey, listen, I've gotten in trouble with my semantics on this show before. I know, I know you that have. That one will not... That one will not get me in trouble. All right, it's time for Buy or Sell, which is presented by our friends at Ice Shaker. Go to iceshaker.com. You can have one of those beauties that Shane is drinking out of, or you can see behind him or me uh, on my bookshelf here. Yeah. If you're watching the video stream, use promo code Wildcat Country, capital W, capital C, and get $5 off, or go to fanatics.com and get one of your own. Okay, number one, Shane, we're going to, I mean, there's not a football game to review, so I'll just keep this one generic. If there is one thing worse than the Pac-12 television contracts, it's the officials in most, if not all, the major sports. Buy or sell? Uh, in a lot of the sports, yeah. I'll, I'll, well, I'll just start with the Pac-12. Obviously, we'll buy that, you know. And again, I, I've said before, and I'll say again, it, I, if you're whatever fan you're a conference of, you probably think your conference has the worst officials. Uh, the yep. difference is in the Pac-12, it probably happens to be true. Uh, yep. And if you're thinking the grass is greener on the other side, uh, that being the Big 12. Look no further to the Houston Texas game and that awful mm-hmm. spot that Houston got on third down, where it should have been first and goal in the last minute, and Houston should have had a chance to tie the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and then that was not reviewed inexplicably. Uh, but then you look at the Pac-12. Uh, you, know, you start with the USC Utah game. I don't think that was a a, a hit in the last minute of that game that was worthy of an of targeting and an ejection. It was roughing the passer, but probably not an ejection, even though it was helmet to helmet. It was sort of inadvertent. Uh, and then the ASU Washington game, so many bad calls. I know no one listening or watching this show is going to have any sympathy for the Sun Devils, and I don't blame you. But they got hosed late in that game uh, with the. It's one thing to to not throw a flag on a blatant pass interference. It's another thing to throw the flag, have a discussion, and then pick it up when it was the, one of the most blatant calls ever. It should have been anyway, uh, most obvious call. So, uh, it. A- ASU, like I want, I want everyone to get a fair result. And, uh, you know, I, I love one of the comments I saw on, on, uh, Elon's platform about, you know, I, as much as I, I just like ASU, I, I love, uh, bad officiating even more and I want to see fair outcome. And I agree with that. So between that and you're talking about, you want to mention the MLB playoffs, uh, you know, it, there's so much to choose from, but I think the Pac-12 officials stole the show again this past weekend. 
Yeah, I'll tell you what, uh, they stink. And ASU did get robbed, albeit they made some questionable decisions, which we'll talk about later yep. in our third segment. But, you know, let me rant about the Pac-12 TV contracts, which are, I would say, equally as bad, Shane. Arizona is now is kicking off at 7.30 on uh, Saturday night against Oregon State. And then another ranked team comes to Tucson the following week, uh, UCLA. And now they're going to be kicking off at 7.30 as well. Listen, the weather's gotten nicer. You know, I understand the late kickoffs in September, but when we're in November and still doing this, come on, TV contract. Like, this is the time to showcase Tucson during the day and to give Arizona a little bit better time period than late at night when nobody on the East Coast is watching. Yeah, it's embarrassing. We, we wait really all is. we wait all year for this kind of weather and and knock on wood, we've had our last 90 degree day of the year. It's supposed to be beautiful this week and next week in the 70s and 80s. This is the time to have day games. Uh yeah. and it at least it's on national television. Uh the UCLA game is on, I think gonna be on Fox, Fox Sports One. The Oregon Great. State game is gonna be on But nobody's ESPN. gonna watch it. Doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate. And and you know, in homecoming as well, people you know, I think there's been a problem at Arizona with people you know, attending the homecoming festivities and then not attending the game. Yeah. And if you have the game that late, people yeah. are just going to go home or they're going to go home by the third or fourth quarter, even if it's a close game and you need fans to be loud and on their feet. So and we saw that in the Washington game. So mm-hmm. it, it's really unfortunate. You know, this is the time. This is why people live in Arizona for the weather this time of year, starting right like right now. And it would be great to see them take advantage of that time slot. And it's unfortunate they're not doing that. Heck, I would rather Arizona play a 9 a.m. kickoff. Because at least people will come during the game. You would think they may not be there at the start. Isn't that what happened to the Oregon game back in 2013? Like fan, more fans trickled into the stadium? Yeah. It, it, well, because it was raining before the game. And yeah. then as the game started and things started to progress, and I kept taking pictures on my phone of the of the crowd filling in yeah. at Arizona Stadium. And it was it was just a, a surreal sight, honestly. I, I would love to see, you know, give me a give me a noon kickoff. Give me a a, give me a 10 a.m. kickoff, something like that. The fans will at least stay because there's nothing better to do during the day. But late at night, they want to go to bed. Me, I mean, I know I have to drive home. I won't get home till one o'clock, but just annoying. I, I I hate both of them. The officials are bad and the TV contracts are bad. End of rant. All right, let's go on to number two, Shane. If Arizona beats Oregon State this weekend, it has a good case to be ranked heading into the homecoming matchup that we just spoke about against UCLA. Yeah, they'll have a case. Uh, if you look at the rankings currently, both the AP and the coaches polls, uh, and Arizona did get some points or votes or whatever you want to call it in the coaches poll, but there are no three lost teams in either poll. Uh, maybe there will be starting next week, but I think that's the problem is like they just, they've lost three games. Uh, so I think they beat Oregon State and UCLA back to back, two ranked teams at home, three straight ranked wins. Then yes, absolutely. They should be at the top 25. I think they have a case if they beat Oregon State, but it realistically, I think they need to win by a decent margin and have a lot of other top 25 teams lose. If that happens, then I think they could crack, they could crack their way in. But, you know, like I always say, if you want your ranking, you want to be ranked higher, just keep winning. And if Arizona does that, they will. All right. So Oregon state's number 11 right now, UCLA is 23. Assuming Mm -hmm. UCLA beats Colorado, uh, they will be ranked uh, coming into Arizona stadium. So, you know what, Shane, I'm going to sell this one. I actually agree with you. If they beat both teams, they will be ranked as a three loss team. Just beating Oregon State this weekend probably gets you to a ranking of about 30. You know, you'll get some some votes, but you won't be in the top 25. I think if they were to to win both of these matchups, which we'll see, Arizona will be ranked heading into Boulder on November 11th. Just a hunch play. I agree. All right, now here's a fun one for you in our last one for buy or sell this week. Which, which total will be higher? Which win total will be higher? Arizona football in its final five games, plus a potential bowl game. Ooh. So let's let's just recap those right now. That's... Home Oregon State, home UCLA at Colorado, home Utah at ASU, potential bowl game, or Arizona basketball against the gauntlet of at Duke, Michigan State and Palm Springs, Wisconsin at home, Purdue and Indianapolis, Alabama and Phoenix, Florida Atlantic in Vegas. Six games potentially against six games. Where are you finding the higher win total? That that is one of the best and most obnoxious questions you've asked because it is su- it is such no it is such a good question it's real I it, just so people know Eric typically sends me the buy or sell questions before we 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 record so he doesn't catch me too off guard even though he likes to to throw in some surprises to keep things interesting uh, this is a tough one I've struggled with this one I, I initially wanted to say football but I'm actually going to go with basketball mm, I, I think okay. that. Are there three wins for the basketball team in there? Uh, probably. It's hard to say because they're going to look so different this season. Um, but there's so much talent there. Uh, they have essentially more or less two home games in there. Uh, was, was it Wisconsin's at home? 
Wisconsin is at home. Alabama is in Phoenix. Phoenix. So one true home game. Yeah. 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 So a couple more or less home games in there. So if Arizona can get to three and then the, or the, the men's basketball team gets to three and then football, they should get to three. And I'm thinking, I, I hate this question because I keep going. I'm still going back and forth on it right now. I'm just going to say basketball and, and and hope that I'm right, but it's a really good question. What do you think? All right. So I think the football team goes three and two down the stretch. And I think, you know, the bowl game is a toss up. Well, who knows who they're going to play? Right. So, so I could see a max of four for football, whichever four games those are, you know, we've talked about that before and we'll probably reevaluate after the Oregon state game, which we'll make our picks for in the final segment of the show, the fourth segment, as we have uh, two guests beforehand, as far as basketball goes, I see three wins in there. I don't think you're winning at Duke. Um, I I don't think you're going to beat Purdue and Indianapolis. Michigan State's going to be tough, but I think Arizona should be favored against Wisconsin, uh, against um, uh, Alabama, and against Florida Atlantic. So I think yeah. I think three and three for basketball seems about right. And I, I mean, I would slightly lean towards football, slightly yeah. with the bowl game. So if you're saying three and two in the regular season, and then like a coin flip for for, for bowl the bowl game, game right. then you're saying three and a half then. Which yeah, is I, I, well, I would I would put the the I mean for both of them, I'd put the win total at two and a half. If I were putting an over under line, yeah, uh, maybe basketball you do three so you can get a push, but I think the football over under is two and a half on the last five games of the regular season, maybe three if we're including a, a potential bowl game. But I would lean football based on what we've seen lately, but that opinion could change if with a stinker of a performance on Saturday. I'm going to put that put as a poll question on Elon's platform. I, I'm okay. interested to see what people are going to say because I'm really struggling with this one. It's a good question and I absolutely hate it. Can I say every now and then Uh, (laughs) coming up next, Miles Simon, new Suns assistant coach, going to join us, followed by Max Brown, a Pac-12 network analyst who it's always fun to talk football with here on Wildcat Country. What's up, everyone? It's Chris Gretkowski and football season is back. Ice Shaker is a proud sponsor of the Wildcat Country podcast. Don't forget to check out some of our new products like the Ice Shaker with the built-in bump box speaker that's going to absolutely pop at your next tailgate party. Let's crush it this season. Bear Dow! Shane, the most famous words of all time in University of Arizona history are from the late Billy Packer. Simon says championship. Well, finally, we have the man behind that uh, infamous phrase, the famous phrase, should I say, Miles Simon, new assistant coach of the Phoenix Suns and 1997 most outstanding player in the NCAA tournament. Thank you so much for joining Shane and I here on Wildcat Country. First of all, I want to ask you uh, your involvement with Tommy Lloyd. Have you gotten a chance to talk to him, uh, paying attention to the program? Just your thoughts on what he has done thus far. Uh, I've only talked to Tommy a few, a few times. Um, you know, obviously he's had a ton of, a ton of early success. Uh, you know, the guy I'm most connected with throughout the program is probably Jack Murphy. He keeps uh, a bunch of us alumni, um, with all the info of what's going on within the program and keeping us dialed in. And, um, I was able to go back to the red blue game a few weeks ago, which was a great time. Uh, and it looks like they're, they're in for another promising season. Yeah, Miles. The uh, well, obviously we're going to get to uh, get to your NCAA tournament run, but uh, just looking at you know there have been more and more upsets in the NCAA tournament lately. You guys know a thing or two about that, obviously. But you know the Wildcats uh, falling to Princeton last year, or one another one seed going going down. Is the NCAA tournament the the most boom or bust, or even like <laughs> brutal format in all of sports? Well, it's tough, man, because it's just the the obviously the one and done and. Um... Like if you just have one off night and or one of your best players has an off night or and and conversely, the other team has one or two good players play above their level, then uh, then it can be over for you. We I still remember kind of experiencing that in 1998, the year after we won the title. Yeah. Uh, You know, myself and uh, Michael Dickerson, we didn't have we didn't have the best games against the Utah team in the Elite Eight, a team that we were probably probably better than. And Andre Miller has a triple double and Hano Medela and Mike Doliak and those guys have great games. And all of a sudden, our back to back dreams were gone. Well, we don't talk about that year. Let's talk about the year before that. Um, <laughs> uh, and it was, it was a crazy run, not just because you obviously you win it all as a four seed, but I think you won every single game in that tournament by single digits. Uh, yeah. Two in overtime. So they were all not nail biters, but they were all reasonably close. At what point during that tournament run did you guys know that you had a chance or that you you knew you were going to win it all? Like, was there, is there a moment for you? 
Um, I don't think there was a particular moment. Our our team had a great uh, air of confidence about ourselves and and how good how good we were. Uh, you know, the one of the big talking points is always that we finished fifth in the Pac-12. But I think what people don't know is going into the Pac-12. Look, as I said Pac-10. Yeah, and um, is that we were tied for second going into the last weekend of the Pac-10, and the Pac-10 was super strong that year. Um, I think five or six teams in the NCAA tournament, uh, three or four to the Sweet 16 uh, slash Elite Eight. And we got swept in the Bay Area, which dropped us from second to fifth. So, like, it looks better now that we won, that we won the title and we were fifth in the pa- in the Pac-10. Um, but we still went into that tournament with a ton of confidence. We didn't believe really that anybody – uh, could beat us on a nightly basis. We had beaten North Carolina, who was uh, one of the favorites, um, you know, going into the tournament. And then I, I, I think the, the the seminal moment, though, was beating Kansas in the Sweet 16. They're the number one seed. We're playing out in Birmingham. Uh, they were, I don't know, whatever their record was, 33-1. and one. They had only lost, you know, I think to Missouri that year, and they had Paul Pierce and Rayful Friends. But beating – Beating that team, I think that that set the tone that like, OK, let's go ahead and do this. You know, Miles, you're the second player that we've uh, been able to talk to on this program from the 97 team. A.J. Bramlett comes on with us uh, every so often. Always great to talk to him. And we ask him about, you know, where we've asked him about like the Kansas game. So you're playing a team, as you just mentioned, that was pretty much invincible as far as college basketball teams go. At what point in that game did you say we got him? <laughs> uh, before tip off. You know, right. I, I think our, our the way we looked at it is like how how are they going to match up to us? Like who's going to stop Mike Bibby? Who's going to guard myself? Who's going to guard Michael Dickerson? And then we had the best six man in the country and Jason Terry. So I think other people looked at it like, OK, Kansas has all these weapons. But look what we look what we had. Um, like there was no doubt in our mind that like uh, Billy Thomas or Jacques Vaughn, like that those guys, they can't, they couldn't guard our perimeter guys. And then the job that AJ and Bennett and Donnell Harris and Eugene did on the, on the interior against Scott Pollard and Rafe LaFrance is not probably not talked about enough. Like those guys were blocking shots, rebounding, finishing around the basket. Um, I think our, our depth actually was um, really to our advantage in that game. You know, in football, the old analogy is it's really tough to beat a team twice. You know, if you play them once during the regular season, then once in the playoffs. Well, you, as you mentioned about North Carolina, you beat them in the first game of the year. You beat them by 11. And now you face them in the final four. Uh, everybody's thinking the revenge angle is in play. This is, you know, a, a really good North Carolina team. Going into that game, you made it further than anybody could have expected. What's the mentality of of Coach O and, and the team at that point? Um, I think it was just a that we had a lot of confidence going to that game, obviously North Carolina playing with probably a little bit of a chip on their shoulder because we beat them um, in Springfield, Massachusetts earlier in the year. And then you got to remember it's a little bit different game because I didn't play in the first, I didn't play in the first game. Um, so they hadn't, they hadn't played us even at our, at our full strength and we had already beaten them at their full strength. And by the time we get to the final four in, in March, um, our team had this like great chemistry uh, because now we had been playing together as a group for like the two and a half months um, since I had become eligible again. That last moment in the uh, Kentucky game for the championship, Miles, uh, that's when those famous words that Eric mentioned were uttered. And you're on the court. Uh, Kentucky elects not to foul. And you kind of call- – first of all, that that overtime is a lesson on the importance of free throws. Right. Uh, but you uh, you you kind of <laughs> collapse on the court with the basketball. What's going through your mind at that moment? Man, it was uh... – at that point, the best basketball moment in my in my career, and it probably still and it probably still is in my life. Um, the Final Four is something. If you guys don't know, it's something I my dad and I grew up, or I grew up, up. My dad taking me to Final Fours. I had been to like six or seven Final Fours uh, in the '80s and to the early '90s, and so like the Final Four was like the pinnacle for me. And then to actually be playing in it, and then to actually win it. Um, it was it was unbelievable. And then to do it with the group that we had and to do it for University of Arizona and all the fans and then especially for Lou Olson, um, who had been so close so many times and that he's got that on his resume uh, because he's one of the one of the greatest of all time. Uh, just like uh, I mean, all those emotions and thoughts were 
were going through going through my mind. Uh, looking back at that season and, and a lot of the seasons that under Lou Olson, he always um, put together a tough non-conference schedule, um, and you combine that with the uh, the Pac-10 schedule, which was a lot tougher than frankly it is now. Did that sort of toughen you guys up? Because Tommy Lloyd's got a gauntlet for the non-conference schedule this year. Six top 25 teams. My co-host is scared. Uh, but what, what are your thoughts on having to face that tough competition during the regular season? Is that something to help prepare you for the tournament? I love that because you, you just wanted to always play the best teams. And that's, you know, whether it's going to the Maui, for us, it was like going to the Maui Classic or going to the preseason NIT when we played like Allen Iverson, um, all these great non-conference games. Um whether they're on neutral site, on the road. Uh, Coach was always going to challenge his teams because he, to be the best, you got to beat the best. And, and that was kind of his his philosophy. And I think that really helps you um, in all types of different situations. Like when you get into that NCAA tournament, um, I remember Coach talking about this, playing different styles of teams, teams that played zone, teams that played press, teams that played fast. Um, and it prepared you for everything that you might see. Like in the NCAA tournament, that year we won at South Alabama, they slowed the game down, um, you know, but like it was a tight game. We had to make it, we had to make a comeback in that first round or else we were going to be out. Um, but I think those preseason games throughout my career, freshman, sophomore and junior year, you know, helped to, uh, you know, help to get us over the top and win the title. I uh, finally had a chance a couple weeks ago when I went down to a football game to uh, walk by uh, the uh, the statue of uh, Lou Dolson there, and uh, and obviously we just we lost him still pretty recently. What is do you have a single favorite memory or a favorite memory of Lou Dolson that you can share with us? Man, um, there's probably more I, than a few. <laughs> there is more than a few. I I think the things that stand out um, about Coach one of them is what a great family man he was. Um, and that was always, that was big, like for, for recruiting purposes. Um, one of my favorite memories is always when one, when I was taking my recruiting visit and then two, when I got to host recruits, always going over to coach's house, um, and having meals over there with him and, and Bobby, who was also like, you know, she's the cornerstone, the backbone, the mother of all, you know, of all Arizona players, um, and just being over there and being at his house and having these like home cooked meals um, and, and coach just in a different atmosphere. Like he's just so relaxed and so great at home and talking to the families and the kids that that's always something that stood out um, for me about coach. And then I always think that coach was ahead of his time in coaching. If you think about like the 1994 final four team with Reggie Geary uh, Khalid Reeves and Damon Stoudemire, like coach was playing small ball before other people were doing it, right? Like Reggie Geary is a 6'2 guard that was playing small forward, which at that time, like in college basketball, like that wasn't, that wasn't happening. And he goes to this small lineup and, and they are just like outrunning teams and, you know, scoring 80, 90 points a game. And um, I just think he was just such an innovator in, in, uh, in the basketball world. Miles, last question for you. Uh, you have had quite the coaching career, not only with the Lakers, then you were, you know, you won the with the G League, and then now uh, with the Suns as an assistant coach. How do you think your coaching style was affected by Lou Dolson? Um, in many in many ways, I I still like I use some drills that that coach had, but I think the biggest thing is um, having also coached uh, for Lou, like learning to um, give my assistant coaches uh, like also like a voice in practice and in games. Um, and that's what, that's one thing that he was great about. It wasn't always, a, it wasn't about like Lute Olsen and that he's the boss and he has to tell all the players what to do. Um, it's really about like what's best, what's best for the team. And um, I think one of the biggest statements that he ever told me as a coach was like, you got to coach, your your top guy your first guy the same as the 14th or 15th guy on the roster like because they 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 want to learn the game um you got to teach them you got to teach them all the same if they're making the same mistakes or if they're doing things well you you praise and you coach everybody uh exactly the same hey it's great advice and we certainly uh, look forward to seeing it in practice this year with the suns 
Uh, as Shane said uh, before our show, hey, you brought a title to, to Arizona. Now, if you can bring one to the Suns, you're on all of our Mount Rushmore in the state. Including so, the uh, Mount Rushmore. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so thank hey, you so much for joining us. Yeah, that's the plan. That's the goal, man. I appreciate you guys having me. Shane, glad to have on one of our favorite Pac-12 network analysts who's awesome at what he does. He is former USC and Pitt quarterback Max Brown. Max, as always, thanks for joining Shane and I here on Wildcat Country. So I'm going to start off with a hard question, then they'll go easier from there. Arizona has five games left. Home against Oregon State, home against UCLA at Colorado, uh, home Utah at ASU. What is the realistic expectation in your mind for how many wins they should generate in those five games? Yeah, I didn't know the schedule off the top of my head. First off, yeah, I appreciate you guys having me. But uh, run through those five games. I think three and two is realistic. If you split the first two ahead between UCLA and uh, in Oregon State, which it's not insignificant. It sounds like it sounds like UCLA might have uh, figured something out at quarterback, which was kind of the missing piece for them. But if you can find a way to split one of those two games, and then I think they should beat Colorado. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I think that should be the expectation going into the game, and then. An ASU to, to an ASU win to end the season, and then feels like Utah may have found something a little bit last week. At least, hey, they beat USC. They're the better team that 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 night. But it feels like Bryce and Barnes again. The quarterback situation. Two uh, Pac-12 teams may have found something in mid October. Speaking of figuring out quarterback situations, uh, like in, we're, <laughs> we're, we're That's actually a hot topic in your guys' territory. A little bit, a little bit. We're actually full transparency. We're recording this before Jed Fish's press conference on Monday, so we're not 100 sure what what he's going to say on, about that situation. But he has to roll with Noah Fafita at this point, doesn't he? I think so. Yeah, and I think you know if if, if Jaden Delore is being honest with himself like that's just how the quarterback position rolls and it's it's unfortunate but it's the nature of the beast of the quarterback position when you have a guy playing really well you're doing your team a disservice uh to to roll with the next guy even if you were i mean outside of maybe being the Heisman trophy winner or being like a returning all american or all conference player like those guys might have an exception but that's just the nature of the beast in football no is playing really well and He's protecting the football, which I think uh, raises Arizona's floor in terms of what they can uh, what they can bring to the park each week. I I feel like with Noah, he's he's more of a uh, like more willing to, to be more of a game manager and let his stars make plays. Whereas Jaden Delora, I feel like takes a little too much on his shoulders. Do you think that's an accurate assessment? I think so. Yeah, I mean, game manager is always a term that nets out differently with 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 uh, with certain folks, but I, I think that's. That's fair to me. I, I just dumb it down to the uh, half a dozen plays a game where Jaden Delora plays off script. You know, sometimes that those plays win you the game, and sometimes those plays lose you the game. That's just the reality of of, of what it's been over the por- over the course of really three or four years now with Jaden Delora. Pac-12 fans watching him, and I think with Noah Fafita, you might not get that one extra. It's third and sixteen. You scramble around and pick it up. So you might be sacrificing that one play, but you're probably gaining the security that you're not going to have the um, unorthodox turnover. As I say that out loud, I remember the shovel pass at, at UW, but that's his first start. And right. what's not insignificant is, you know, he's only got a few starts under his belt. So this is how he's looking right now with playing some really good teams. What do things look like when he has another three starts down the road? And so I think that. Uh, that's obviously not insignificant where you're thinking not just in the short term, but long term for the program as well. Yeah, but are you concerned if you were a coach, Max, if you if a player were to take over just because of injury, you know, when one guy went down, the other guy takes over. We call it the uh, the Lou Gehrig, Wally Pip or Wally Pip, Lou Gehrig situation. Is that fair? And do you risk losing a team like that? I think you risk losing the team if you mismanage it. And I think you risk losing the team if it's the opposite side, too. Like if you start Jaden Delora and you lose or things aren't great, then I'm sure there's a scenario where you can make the argument that you're losing the team because it's a coach that's adhering to maybe not who's the best player right now. So it goes both ways. And I think it's on Jed to, um, you know, handle the locker room, handle that situation appropriately. I've seen the stuff on Twitter with Fafita and Delora's family, and it sounds like they're friends and whatnot, which I'm sure there's, I'm sure that's the truth. But I also know, like, hey, Delora is a fiery guy. Like, he's not he's not stoked on the idea of sitting on the bench. Like, both can coexist. So it sounds like Jed will not have as tall of a task in handling that as maybe I was just watching the uh, Tua Tagovailoa and uh, Jalen Hurts 
uh, rewind from a few years ago with the Alabama situation. Like even those guys were class act, but that's a dicey situation to handle. I feel like Jed's in an easier situation right now. And I feel like Jed's personality is great for this, right? He's not robotic. He's not stiff and kind of always coach talk, which I think in a scenario like this allows him to rate, relate to players and allows him to just be straight with guys because that's just really how Jed is. Yeah, and, and you have to give Jed a lot of credit. He does seem like a player's coach. So let's hope this. Let's hope he makes the right decision. And I think we all know what that is. Now let's switch sides of the ball. You called a handful of Arizona games last year. You called some this year. Defensively, how much better, in your opinion, are the Wildcats? And is it is it noticeable? Is it personnel? Is it scheme? Like, what do you think is the is the main difference? Yeah, I go even big picture. I go more of a just an overall confidence element. And to answer your question, yes, they look better. They look better. They, they are better statistically. And then they that jumps off the tape as well. And I think you're seeing the byproduct of hey, a lot of those true freshmen that played last year, um, and they were they they showed good signs in year two. Now they're progressing, they're growing, and now they're literally bigger and they're literally more confident. So I think that's a great sign. And I just feel like last year watching the team, it was very much. Hey, you knew Arizona, the offense was going to put up 35, but it was literally like you're just hanging on defensively. And it's like, all right, can we get one stop a quarter? That's like all we need. That's the recipe for success versus now you're in a scenario where it's, hey, this Arizona defense, they can win us some quarters. And if you win us one quarter, that might win us the game. And so that jumps off to me. And um, yeah, I, think, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in USC, uh, USC parts. And it's funny, Christian Roland Wallace, uh, Arizona transfer, has been a bright spot on the team the past couple of weeks. And it always has me thinking, because I've also spent a, a lot of time around the Arizona program, is like, hey, there's a reason that dude transferred. And the reason he transferred is because there was some ex exciting, or one of the reasons, I'm sure, you guys are closer to it than me, but one of the reasons is, hey, there were some exciting young guys behind him. And so that allowed him to uh, go to the next spot and uh, find a new home. Let's uh, take a look at the uh, the Oregon State matchup, Max. Uh, Really, what, probably one of the most anticipated games in Tucson in a long time with Arizona coming off the big win in Pullman. Uh, Oregon State, very balanced offense. They have one of the best rushing attacks in the Pac-12 with Damian Williams leading the Pac-12 in rushing yards. DJ uh, Uyungale, did I say that right? I, I eventually yep, nailed okay. it. Nailed it. Fantastic. I might try it again at some point. Uh, he's been a pretty good game manager in himself, but Oregon State is definitely more of a balanced, maybe even run first uh, offense. Arizona has been a lot better against the run this year than they were last year. How does Arizona slow down Oregon State's offense? Yeah, it'll be a bit of a change of mentality in this game because you're going from the defense showing well versus USC, the defense showing well versus Washington State, and then now this is really, I think, the only offense in the conference that is still pro-style. Um, Utah has those elements, but they still spend a lot of time in shotgun, and they're not doing as much uh, – play action tight end work I mean this is a this is an Oregon State team that they can bleed eight minutes off of a quarter in one drive without even thinking um but I will say the passing attack uh I called the game when uh, DJ Uyungle was the offensive player of the week for the conference versus Cal a couple weeks ago he's leveled up he, he's strung two really good weeks together um not even from a game manager standpoint but going out there and making plays on third down which is what they really had challenged him to um and he's playing at, playing at a high level so I think this is a a complete different defensive shift for Arizona now having to be a game where it's, Hey, it's a lot of in between the hash type plays. It's a, Hey, buckle up your chin strap. They're going to run right at you with multiple backs. Jack Velling has scored. I think it's five touchdowns in their past two games. Their tight end who uh, came in for Luke Musgrave, who's now in the NFL. So it's a lot of the same with Oregon state, but I do think they've leveled up really kind of across the board with an offensive line. That's extremely experienced. Their left tackle, Joshua Gray, has nearly like 40 starts, and they got two other offensive linemen captains on the team. So that's where their uh, their bread's buttered. And defensively, um, it's an active group, which, hey, for Noah Fafita, still a younger quarterback, they can throw a lot lot at you. Their, their package is pretty uh, pretty vast defensively, which um, it's, been, it's been good for Oregon State, um, but there has been quarters where uh, teams have been able to get after them. One of the things that Eric and I talked about last week was, um, you know, Jed Fish's biggest task during the bye week, maybe convincing these guys that they haven't arrived yet because you're coming off of you know, the biggest road win in in over a ranked team in Arizona history. And I think there maybe there's this temptation for if 18, 19, 20 year olds that were arrived, maybe you don't have to put in quite as much work. I'm not saying that they're not doing that, but have you been part of situations like that where where you know guys start thinking them, you know, maybe we're 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 we've arrived and 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 how do you 
keep maintain the confidence without a, you know kind of get into the area of arrogance. Yeah, it's a good point, especially coming off a win where uh, Washington State beat Oregon State, and then you blew right. blew the doors off of Washington State. So I'm sure guys are making that parallel uh, a little bit at SC. I think we had some streaks at USC where you know we were playing really good football, but the standard and so much of it's just the program standard and the standard that Jed you know adheres these guys to. But we were playing well at SC. But even at a place like USC, like there was so much left to still tap into in terms of getting back to, in our perspective, like the Pete Carroll days of what that meant of, hey, it's not only just playing well, it's not only just beating teams, but it's dominating teams and 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 getting back to that level. So I think your point's spot on in terms of, all right, it's a fine line between confidence and then that confidence bleeding over to complacency. And that's the that's the job of the ta- of the coaches. It's the job of the captains too. A lot of that's on the players too. Hey, a lot of those guys came to Arizona to turn the culture around. And now we can see it turning around. But is it just going to be one of those things where you take a, a modest U-turn, U-turn or do you take the U-turn and blitz it 60 miles an hour down the road and really turn this thing uh, full-fledged around to, to the point where you're you know, expecting to compete and expecting to win every game that you play? All right, and my last question, and we'll Eric and I will make our picks at the end of the show, but just give us your prediction for this game on Saturday. I think it's going to be a tough one for Arizona. I expect Oregon State to take care of business. I think, uh, like I said earlier, the the matchup is a total change of the guard from playing USC Arizona or playing USC Washington State to playing Oregon State with the physicality. Um, Oregon State's got a lot to play for too. Still right in the thick of uh, you know conference conference title conversation. A lot of teams are sleeping on them. I think Oregon State's a really good football team. I'd expect it to be a. Uh, I'll go. I'll go 35-24 Oregon State. And there you have it. I don't know. I may go on the other end. We'll see what happens. Uh, when I respect picks it. Yeah, I mean, you know, listen, it's just a, it's one of those games. And I think my last question for you, you know, Max, when it comes to home field advantage in this conference, now we saw USC didn't work so well for them this past week against Utah. How much do you think that makes a difference? Because to me, I think Oregon State and Utah, for example, have extreme home field advantages Arizona still to be determined. I I think teams on the road, I just don't trust those two teams on the road, let's say as much as I would at home. Give me your thoughts on that. I think it's a great point. And I haven't looked at the schedule of the games at Arizona this weekend. It is. Yeah. No, I think that's 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 a really fair point, especially because Research Stadium's, I think, one of the most underrated college football atmospheres you could say in the country. But uh out west, I think we know it's up. It's a different team, especially defensively for Oregon State. Um, I feel like they thrive off that energy and Hey, the last road game that Oregon state had, I called that game. It was in Cal. They were playing a, they were playing a red shirt freshman quarterback who had his best game to this point, or at least that was his first start. And it, it was a Cal offense that put up, I think it was like 38 points in that game. So I would look to the Oregon state defense, especially on the road. Um, can they, can they, can they gear up without the home crowd energy? And especially if Arizona gets out to a hot start, I think it's a totally fair point with Oregon State being a different team on the road. Now, in addition to seeing you on Pac-12 Network, where can people find you on the internet? I know we have you on the show fairly often, but you have a pretty good uh, following there on TikTok apparently as well. Yeah, it's funny how things shake out. TikTok's my uh, largest platform these days. And funny enough, uh, Twitter is actually the smallest one. So I know a lot of uh, sports fans are hanging out on Twitter, but Hop on over to TikTok on Instagram as well, YouTube shorts as well. I do, uh, during the season, I do breakdowns, X and O's breakdowns of uh, not only just highlights, but why a specific play happened across college ball and NFL ball. So it's been fun and uh, fun covering the, the conference in the in the last uh, last year as its current, current form. And that's why you're a rising star in broadcasting and we look forward to uh, continue to have you on our show. Max, thanks as always for joining us. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate it. Well, Shane, it's one of the rare four-segment shows that we have on this program, but it's I'm excited to have my buddy Jake Voorhees, who is the producer of Early Edge, who gets to hear all of my winning, well, maybe not so much winning, college football picks every Wednesday on our college show. He's going to join us and try to outpick fellow colleagues. The coach, uh, Alan Bell, uh, was on. Um, have we had anyone else, Shane? I'm not sure. I think just A.B. and... Uh, From your show? Coach. No. Uh, who, who did... The coach did pretty well the first week, didn't he? Or did no, he didn't. He, no, he didn't. Oh, he did not didn't. do well. And okay. AB didn't do that well. So, Jake, okay. 
you know, we're glad to have you. Thanks for doing this. It's actually and- all I'll mention, Jake. It's, it's it's actually a pretty low bar because our guests have not been doing well lately. And and on That's the perfect. other perfect. <laughs> and then the other side, Eric, uh, do you hear those footsteps? I, I'm I'm getting a little. Co- but, all right. So first of all, let me just say this: Coach was four and six. Okay. AB okay. was five and four. So there's not much to live up to there. No offense to those guys. I'm sure we'll have them back on. But Shane is gaining on me. I had like an eight game lead, mm. and it's down to two. Two. And the guest pickers are seven behind us. So Jake and I are going to have some disagreements this week. Let's get right into it. And I'll let him make the first one, Shane. Oklahoma is a 10 and a half point favorite at Kansas. They almost lost to Central Florida last week at home. Does Kansas get them, Jake? What do you feel about with the spread? Honestly, I don't think they do. It's kind of a letdown spot last week. Uh, I think this line is a little disrespectful for Big 12 play for them, to be honest. Uh, they've been great under Venables 10 years so far in the two years. The, dude, the issues that quarterback with Kansas are just too much for me. I think they cover. I think they win by two touchdowns. Okay, Shane? I'm. It's one of those rare things where I'm still on the fence as I'm going into this because I feel like I agree that o- OU should cover easily. On the other hand, I feel like they're one of those teams that's like – they're they're gonna lose. They're gonna fall at some point. They should have. They almost did this past week, and maybe this next game is is where it's gonna happen. So, I I was leaning toward Kansas covering. I'm gonna stick with that, even though I don't feel good mm-hmm. about it. I I think OU wins, but I think it's another tenuous game for OU. I, I I think they're gonna lose eventually. I don't think it's gonna be this week. Yeah, I actually like Oklahoma in this spot. I agree with you, Shane. I do think they're gonna lose eventually, but I think the bounce back after that lackluster UCF effort. I just don't trust Kansas's defense to slow anyone down. And who knows, as Jake mentioned about the quarterback situation, uh, I don't trust Jason Bean and Jalen Daniels. Who knows if he's actually healthy? I'll take Oklahoma to win by at least two touchdowns. So the 10 and a half is nothing there. How about this one? This is a really interesting line. Georgia is minus 16 against Florida uh, in the game played in Orlando, formerly the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. Shane, who you got? Uh, I, I don't think Georgia's the best team in the country. Now ask me who is. I don't know. Maybe Michigan, maybe someone else. I, I think that they're due to lose in the, a regular season game before the obviously before the season's over. I don't know if it's this one, but I don't think they cover. I think Florida makes it a game. I think it's maybe a, a touchdown, 10 points. So I'm going to take Georgia to win, but not cover. Jake? You know what? I, I know Bowers is out, and I know he's the workhorse of that offense, but I just don't see any way they don't cover against Florida. Florida has been a completely different team week in and week out every single SEC game they've played. So give me Georgia by 16. I actually like Florida here with Bowers out. I'm not sure I trust that Georgia offense as much as I should. I don't know about Florida's uh, defense. Hasn't been all that great lately. But Graham Mertz is playing at a high level, shockingly. So I think I think Florida finds us a way to keep this within two touchdowns, maybe even within 10. I mean, I'm not calling the upset, but I think this game is going to be more interesting than people give it credit for. Let's put it that way. All right, now here's a really interesting one. Oregon's a four-and-a-half-point favorite at Utah. And as I always talk about on our Wednesday college football shows on the Sportsline shows, which you can find on YouTube, by the way, uh, I, Utah is so good at home. And they haven't lost at home, I think, since 2020. I'll take them plus four-and-a-half, Jake. I feel like this is a, a really good bet, and I almost would consider taking the money line. So that's exactly what I was going to say. I think they're live to outright win this matchup. And in some places, it's creeped up to six, six and a half. You can find that. You're going to give me two field goals. I'll take those points, but I'll take my plus four and a half as well. Shane? Uh, Against all logic, you guys lay out a good case. I feel like Oregon's just a better team, and they're going to go in and win. I feel like Utah is is going to fall at some point. You know, they keep finding ways to win. They're a very well-coached team. Uh, And and we've Cam rising out. No, we know the rest of the season. Um, I just feel like eventually their luck's going to run. I wouldn't say luck, but their run is going to run out. Very very well said, Shane. Uh, I think Oregon's going to win and they're going to cover. Okay, fair enough. Now, here's a team that I don't know what to predict. So you guys can go ahead first. USC is minus 10 at Cal. Cal's not very good, but USC right now. Shane, they are an utter disaster. What I do you keep, think? I keep feeling like I keep predicting USC to have a get right game and it hasn't happened yet. Uh, if nope. it doesn't happen this weekend, I don't know when. You know, the stat that, that Caleb Williams is four and seven against top 25 teams. Well, Cal's not a top 25 team. I think they're actually the worst team in the conference. Uh, I think a, a, the way ASU's played, I'd put them just slightly ahead of Cal. Uh, so I got to think that USC is going to find a way to bounce back and cover. Jake? I don't think Cal is quite the pit of despair we thought they would be at the beginning of the year. But that being said, they're still pitiful. I think USC bounces back and wins by two scores here, the two touchdowns. All right. This one I've gone back and forth on, and I'm actually going to stick with what I just changed it to. I'm going with Cal to cover this line. I think USC wins this by a touchdown. But has USC quit? 
is does Caleb Williams care anymore? We'll find but, out. Did yeah, he if he wasn't getting paid question. by NI right? Yeah, if he wasn't getting paid for and with NIL money, just shut it down because you don't want to get hurt. You don't want to jeopardize anything going to the NFL. But, well, I was going to say though. On the other hand, though, your NFL draft stock. I mean, you don't want to to show NFL it, teams your phone or didn't your phone. Oh, come on, Shane. With the rumors that are going on with this guy at this point, he might be better off shutting it down. Yeah. I mean, I, not that I would ever advocate for that. I I think I think what you saw at the end of last game with none of them going out to midfield after losing to Utah is not a great look. And I, there are definitely some questions about what's going on in that locker room right now. I, I would agree, but I'm going to, so I'm going to take Cal, but it's, I'm not confident in that pick. Yeah. That would be a lean as I like to say on the, uh, on the college football show. All right. Washington minus 26 and a half at Stanford. Shane, I'm going to let you start with this one. What a disgraceful effort on Saturday by the Huskies against ASU but Stanford also, they were awful against UCLA. So two picks yeah. that, that I got wrong. What do you think? Yeah, Washington played that game like it was the 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 morning after the uh, the Oregon game, and they were still hungover. Uh, and credit to ASU, they played well, and they got. And we talked about earlier, they got a little, little screwed late in that game. Uh, not that any of our listeners care, uh, but I think Washington was uh, given too much, too many points against ASU. I think it's the same thing against Stanford. I think uh, Washington wins, but Stanford fi- finds a way to cover. Jake. I think this line is even higher if Stanford doesn't win against Colorado. I like them by 30. Wow. I think they okay. bounce back. Yeah. This one, I, I'm going to lean Washington. I'm going to, and I'll obviously make that pick for the, the sake of the show, but this is a game I wouldn't, this is a line I wouldn't touch at all. Which Stanford are we going to see? The one that roared back in the second half against Colorado, as Jake said, or what we saw against UCLA last week, which was just an utter debacle and obviously cost me money late Saturday night. Shocker. Uh, so I'm going to lean Washington, but not confidently. All right, here's a here's an interesting one. So Wisconsin was a pick that I gave out on the, the sports line show last week, and they got lucky down two touchdowns in the fourth quarter, came back and won. Now they're a 13 and a half point home dog against Ohio State, who I faded last week, thought Penn State would play better. That Ohio State defense looks for real, Jake. What do you think? Yeah, I think you said it. That Ohio State defense looks for real. And if you can get Harrison ball too, I think, you know, two touchdowns is well within their reach against Wisconsin. Shane? I think this is a classic. You, you struggle after a huge matchup kind of game. I think Ohio State wins, but it's on the road. Uh, Wisconsin's got got nothing to lose. I think it's going to be a one score game, maybe even closer than the Penn State game. I think Ohio State wins, but I don't think they cover. My favorite play without looking, without knowing the number, is probably the under. That Ohio State defense is for real. Wisconsin's defense also really, really good. But I don't trust a Wisconsin backup quarterback who did absolutely nothing for three quarters. I'm going to lean Ohio State minus thirteen and a half and make that pick, but definitely not confident in that one uh, for this particular show. All right. Uh, This is a weird line to me. Colorado at UCLA, and the Bruins are favored by 16 and a half. Shane, I'll start with you. Uh, Are we already fading Dion's team this much? Yeah, interesting line. I mean, I think it's more of respect to uh, to UCLA and what they did this past weekend. Uh, As much as I I think we know by now how how overhyped Colorado was, even though they're obviously much better than they were last year, which is a, a low bar. I think they find a way to cover at UCLA. They, they've had time to stew over that Stanford loss. I think UCLA is a better team. I think they win, but I think it's going to be a close, low scoring game. Jake? Yeah, I think with that offense, they're just too explosive. 16 and a half is too many points. To give I think so too. Yeah, I think so too. I, I think the lower scoring game is probably right, but I think Shador Sanders manages something. And I can see this game within 10 to 14 at, at the worst. So I actually like Colorado at this line coming off a bye as well. Don't underestimate that. All right. A team that needs to get right is Washington state. There is a six and a half point favorite at ASU. You know, I think ASU over, you know, outplayed what we expected last week against Washington, more of a letdown spot for the Huskies, Washington state. I mean, you got to win this game by a touchdown. So I'm rolling with the, the Cougs uh, to win by seven to 14 points, somewhere in that ballpark. Jake, I'll start with you. What do you think? Yeah, I think they've had a really tough slate the last couple of weeks, and I think they bounce back by a touchdown for sure here. Okay, Shane? ASU's due to break through at some point. I mean, the the, the Washington game, they led late. Uh, the, the Colorado game, they could have won. The game at Cal, they probably should have won. At some point, they're going to break through. I don't think it's going to be in this game. But I do like, I, for whatever reason, I like um, not picking ASU to win, but picking them to cover. That seems to, that strategy's worked pretty well for me. It worked for me last weekend, and I'm going to stick with it. Shane, just, you know, quick thing about ASU. Did you find Kenny Dillingham's just 
decisions to be kind of baffling on fourth down. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he would kick a field goal when I expect him to go for it. He'd punt when I expect him to, to, to kick field. every time at fourth down where I, I was sure they're going to do something. He did something else. I'm not saying that's the reason they lost, but uh, that, that fourth down decision late in that game, um, you can talk about how they were screwed at the, at that non-pass interference call, which they absolutely were. They were. Was, I was shocked, not shocked, surprised they didn't kick a field goal. I know their kicker had missed two already, but that was the a chip shot. You go up four points. Washington couldn't move the ball for whatever reason. Michael Penix is playing like he was drunk. So I would have kicked the field goal in that situation. But, you know, hindsight being 20-20 as it is. And finally, two teams coming off a bye in week nine of the college football season. Oregon State, who's ranked in the top 15, is now at Arizona, who, as Shane and I talked about earlier in the show, Will they be ranked if they pull the upset? All right, Jake, I'm going to start with you. Oregon State is minus three and a half. The line has gone down to three and a half at Arizona. Give a little analysis and a score pick, if you would. Yeah, I, you know what? I think these are both two teams who are so great against the spread, but DJ, you and that Oregon State team rolls on you guys. I hate to say it, 27-20, and they cover the three and a half. Okay, fair enough. All right. Shane, I'll go to you next. Um, okay, I'm, I have I'm gonna, a feeling. It, it, Let's it, go. Yeah, ahead. I'm I'm going to leave it to you to be to be the uh, the 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 bearer of uh, of good news or positive positivity because I kind of feel the same way that Jake and, and Max Brenner guessed it earlier. I think Oregon State is a completely different team from Washington State, which isn't silly a bad thing, but they're a very well balanced team, a very well coached team, solid on both sides of the ball, don't make a lot of mistakes. They can run the ball well, which Arizona's done a good job stopping the run. But I just think that combination, I, I think Oregon State's going to find a way to wear down Arizona's defense and score enough points. And I think that it, Oregon State's going to throw so many different looks at, at uh, Noah Fafita, assuming that he starts uh, against or, against or uh, in that game against Oregon State. I just think it's going to be a little too much to overcome. And I also think there's that factor of Arizona, maybe they're a humble team co- collectively, but I still think that it's really tempting for these guys to think they arrived, they had an extra a week to prepare, so I think that they're not quite there yet to ready yet to win this kind of game at home. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm going to go Oregon State 30, Arizona 21. Okay. Now I'm going to play the transitive property game, which I know is a dangerous one. Uh, September 23rd, Washington State at home, 38, visiting Oregon State, 35. Then let's go back a couple of weeks. Arizona, 44, Washington State, 6. Does it mean anything? Absolutely not. Did I just want to get it in on the show? Absolutely. Just a gut feeling. This Wildcats team just looks different. Oregon State, I'm not sure I trust them on the road. And that's why I know I'm 6-1 and one picking Arizona games against the spread this year. I was way off against Washington State. I'm going to get back on track this weekend. I don't need the three and a half points. Give me Arizona 27, Oregon State 23. Is it a homer pick? Maybe. Do I care? No. Wildcats win this game. Just a gut feeling. Shane, any thoughts on that? Well, I hope you're right. And your your point about Oregon State uh, having a huge home field advantage and not being as good on yeah. the road, absolutely, absolutely, that could play uh, play a role in this game. Uh, I just think I think it's going to be a close, grinded out kind of game. I just think that it, it's more about the matchup, and I think this is not a great matchup for Arizona. That's why I'm leaning the Beavers. Jake, thank you so much for joining Shane and I. It's always uh, fun to have uh, a guest picker on, and let's see if you can outpick our colleagues, Coach and uh, and AB. But uh, what a show we've had tonight, Shane. We had uh, Miles Simon. I mean, that's a that's a, one of our bigger guests we've had in a while. Max Brown, always great to talk to him, and Jake Voorhees. So uh, an awesome show for Shane Dale. I'm Eric Cohen. Thanks for listening, and as always, bear down. Bear down.